Hello everyone, today we give a general introduction about Renaissance artillery. So even here, big topic, well, let's try to be concise and to get um, to, to outline uh, the main um, characteristics of these guns at the time and their employment and their impact on politics and, um, and society just in, uh, rather than just warfare because um, this is the time into which um, the uh, technological improvements uh, basically push the, uh, the modern states to centralize the, for the sake of fiscal income in order to finance uh, uh, increasingly uh, greater uh, armies into which artillery had definitely a role and, uh, and artillery also um, fastened up um, and uh, I'd say war from a strategical point of view in the sense that it could make crumbles what um, up to a few centuries before were considered impregnable um, fortresses and now states had to finance uh, also um, a new type of military engineering um, <coughs> and, um, and therefore needing to find the resources to, um, to achieve this. So it's, it's really a um, very big topic um, that revolves still uh, erroneously, I believe, on the concept of the military revolution. I mean, the idea that the introduction and introduction of firearms was kind of, um, you know, a, a revolution. No, it wasn't. It wasn't at all because firearms took uh, centuries before they they became uh, even something meaningful, and they kept evolving mm, far ahead from the, the Renaissance times. And indeed they played a role, but they weren't really the decisive factor in, in, in the whole process. Um, um, they, uh, it took, think about firearms, it took two full centuries before for, f for passing from the, the pike and shot tactics to the linear tactics. So, and even artillery had a very, um, very long development, if you think how it arrived to be even up to our days. Uh, overall, it it was a relatively slow um, development, but this this uh, kind of relative toes. I I want to focus on something else. Um, but uh, let's say that today we will talk most of all about the uh, not just about the performances of these guns that I discussed in other videos. I think um, enough. We will come back on it a little, but just stressing the logistical problems, and especially the mobility of these guns. Because I would like to make you understand essentially two things. First of all, th um, that uh, when you think of artillery, you don't have to think about the huge uh, piece that, um, like the one here I've, I've decided to, to put into the background, that were really um, monstrous pieces considering the, the average. But in fact the existence of other um, smaller guns that for centuries um, uh, really had a very important role in, in Renaissance warfare and that uh, were uh, much more versatile and mobile and um, you have even to think um, uh, and, and I explained this about uh, a video made on the uh, 15th um, century types of, of guns that I did recently, that even the certain uh, certain types of guns as such were named that usually um, uh, was based on the mm, on the structure of the gun itself, and not really in its dimensions. I mean, you could find um, every form of uh, of gun that could have very small to 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 monstrous uh, dimensions and 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 that obviously affected the the even the same tactical um, environment in which they could work uh, and their function and their uh, utility and the, the need of having them in different numbers. But I would like to stress in here also the cooperation of all these um, very different and uh, definitely not standardized type of guns. We will deal also with standardization today. But just for saying that artillery was, we can argue, since since a very early time, something very versatile that was adapted, obviously, to the practical needs of of warfare. Also, because uh, you, we have to consider that pitched battles remained, even in uh, early modern warfare, something uh, something rare, or at least even if they increased uh, in time, because 
there were bigger states that could fear, field larger uh, armies and, and these w would tend to engage at a certain point in open field. The, the majority of military operations remained just like today and in all history made up of uh, skirmishes, prolonged sieges, exploration and all. So um, artillery was used in many other contexts com um, than the scenographic and choreographed um, 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 open field battle into which old guns fired at once and all. Um, and you can see from, from the very early times, I mean if you take the uh, Hussites or Hussites, I don't know how you say that in English, wars in Bohemia, in the 15th century Bohemia, well you notice this, that uh, of an incredibly dynamic use of, of, um, of artillery that were usually, um, you know, small cannons mounted on carts and on, uh, on wagons actually that could be moved quite quickly around the battlefield and and shooting around even though uh, in the case of the use sites that was mainly a defensive thing like the wagon cart was used like uh, in other times of history like uh, a defense for a like a mobile fort uh, into which you had to enclose yourself while the enemies uh, at this point, the cavalry, f feudal cavalry, was um, <coughs> was assaulting you, and therefore using these guns, and especially at a close range, also because the technology of the time wouldn't allow you more than much, especially for guns uh, carried on um, so um, uh, on, on such relatively agile carts. Um, so and and we find even uh, very um, discreet use of uh, varied use of these guns during the the later stages of the Hundred Years' War. Famously, the French have to tank uh, firearms because um, those allowed them to 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 get rid of the problem of the uh, English longbow and to carry out successfully a at the uh, the end of of, of the war um, in this sense we will talk about France a lot because France um, especially after the end um, of the hundred years war was definitely the the greatest power in Europe uh, it was um, in practice the um, the earliest uh, national monarchy and the one that reached uh, the um, um, let's say the unification of today's French territories and therefore owning a, a great amount of resources that could be um, successfully invested by a centralized government to produce guns on a large um, in a large in large quantities and to f to, to to obviously uh, create a lot of problems uh, to 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 the the enemies of the, of France uh, and. Um, uh, and and, and uh, the um, uh, however we have to think that the evolution even in in Renaissance warfare of the um, of cannons was as I was saying before relatively slow. I mean during this period, especially the early modern era, it wouldn't be uh, rare to still find um, cannons who were m mounted on static bases or uh, through. Uh, cranes, uh, especially the bigger ones, and uh, that uh, were still carried by wagons uh, for transport. Mm. So even uh, advanced armies like it could be uh, the one of um, um, even of, of certain emerging powers like the one of the Habsburgs or even the French, uh, up to a certain point at least, um, still used the, this kind of guns. Um, that went, as we were saying before, uh, together with uh, with the use of, of of smaller, lighter guns that uh, were used uh, in, in concert, uh, if we want. So, um, I I like to stress the the the, the presence of big and small guns uh, at the same time, with a numeric prevalence of the latter, of course, to to really um, focus on the fact that artillery wasn't. Um, extremely effective. I mean, Renaissance warfare definitely uh, pushed for even uh, for the development of new military engineering, the Tras Italien, um, because the Italians pioneered um, at that time, among other things, 
um, this um, this new military um, 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 th this new military um, constructions, these fortifications that had completely different characteristics from the ones that uh, had existed in Europe up to a uh, very few time before, the, the, the walls being lower, uh, the uh, having, uh, you know, um, um, uh, having uh, being surrounded by ditches and, 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 and I mean several lines of ditches and trenches and having an inclined um, uh, wall so that they, they, the, the, the artillery uh, wouldn't hit 90 degrees with all its strength and damage in it, I mean all things and, and, and def definitely um, different um, 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 different um, mm, maps uh, that followed also certain ge geometric criteria that were aimed essentially at deflecting the uh, the artillery fire. So um, something that really shows the the impact of uh, the new artillery technology into uh, on, on so many levels into um, uh, Western warfare and not only because. Uh, really, uh, the most advanced artillery that you could find in Europe was the one of of the Ottomans. Uh, from a certain point, at least the Ottomans pioneered uh, much of of the um, uh, artillery technology. Um, we know that um, the Chinese had also a, a great um, impact on this um, on this aspect. Where the, the first ones to cast iron, um, which needed uh, enough uh, to to create cast iron cannons. I mean, that needed very high temperatures to achieve. I mean, uh, the whole world was really evolving towards the um, the pike and shot tactics, uh, if you want. Even if in Europe. Uh, you have, especially for infantry warfare, the uh, for, for essentially for social, political, social, economical causes, the real development of the pike blocks and all. But in terms of artillery, um, Asia was also pretty much advanced at this time. It would remain for for longer than that. That is always that is um, usually uh, believed. Also, the idea that the Europeans at a certain point surpassed the Ottomans into artillery technology is something that has been a bit too overly stressed. In, in, in telling the truth, until the, the, the end, very end of the 17th century, the Ottomans uh, were pretty up-to-dated into, um, into artillery technology and, and there is no actual proof that they, they lacked behind because they didn't know technolo technology uh, from a certain point onwards, but simply because uh, their state was crumbling. Um, and and they simply didn't have the money to keep up with that, but not because they had uh, declined in this sense. There is also a striking difference uh, between the um, you know the, the historical um, possibility of looking into those things, meaning that uh, we have tons of of treatises written into Europe at the time relative to these things. Well, it's a bit more difficult to find that in the East. And therefore, we, we sometimes picture these developments in a quite arbitrary or even speculative way, when the few evidence that we actually have is um, is is really pushing towards a more um, a different direction. Uh, my my personal interest is to stress how um, we moderns have terrible technological prejudices, for which we see that you know the guy who has the the, the bigger gun is the one who wins essentially, and this is completely false. I mean, the the evolution of warfare at this point had nothing to do with this technology in practice, but in the way in t into which they were applied, and in even in in the possibility into which uh, they they could be applied, like. Like as early as the 16th century, you could have, for instance, automatic guns already. Yes, but the the, the technology was simply, uh, you know, inconvenient to be used, and uh, and even in, in in siege warfare, you see that these amazing guns and th that are increasingly um, more numerous on in in siege warfare. Actually, they they didn't solve everything. The, the, the military engineering was something very complicated, very slow. There is the presence of mines, of, of entrenching, of very slow war, as a matter of fact. So technology um, overall diluted in all this is not really what made the difference. Although, as I was saying before, 
every up-to-dated sovereign or, of Europe uh, from this time onwards uh, did necessarily have to use uh, to have an artillery uh, park on its own and don't give for granted that everybody had because that meant a huge investment and there were smaller countries that simply couldn't afford that or, or poorer countries that uh, kind of uh, uh, even among powers that eventually would have risen in the in the later modern uh, age, like I don't know Sweden or Brandenburg, etc. At these times, were were lagging far far behind. Although uh, at one point um, they they pushed on. For instance, Sweden. Um, we're not talking about naval warfare in here, but it's extremely fascinating. Sweden from a, cer a certain point of view lacked a, a consistent fleet like Denmark already had, the Anseatic League already had but there were kind of the old fleet like um, mercantile ships adapted to warfare the Swedes at a certain point decide that they had to, to have a, f uh, a fleet that could compete on their own and they um, uh, decided to, 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 to go a step forward and create uh, uh, ships, military ships that were conceived uh, structurally, engineeringly speaking, as properly military ships, therefore not cargo ships adapted, but ships made up just for launching cannons and for being warships on their own. So even um, um, here those who arrive later in many ways all in technology sometimes are the ones who are kind of more receptive, have less um, um, uh, resis resistance to tradition because they have to start from zero and so they, they go. It's like um, like today's um, developing countries. I mean certain countries of Africa that are considerably backwards today have however the, the most innovative uh, technologies employed into computers and to communications and all while there are there are maybe a European uh, countries that are considerably more advanced, but since they have developed before, we on other bases have more difficultly, more difficult to really um, renew everything uh, um, from zero. And and this is really what happened in warfare. Like, um, and there were countless problems of this kind. I mean, th there were countries that simply couldn't make it to produce things on their own. Like England was pretty much. Uh, dependent on uh, Flemish military technology at this time because they, they simply couldn't afford, the, they didn't have the, um, uh, how do you call that, the, uh, the, the, the resources in general, but the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, I don't know how to say this, but really the base even to, to produce these things, they, they lacked the, the the sheer amount of, of of craftsmen, of resources, and all to uh, and centralization to put up something more consistent. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I was drinking <coughs> a little, and um. Very simple things like wheeled carriages at this time for guns were firstly used um, uh, in um, in the 15th century. Um, the um, Fran France and <coughs> excuse me and Burgundy were at this time developing quite cons quite consistent quite consistent uh, consistent parks of artillery, um, for which they had the obvious problem of carrying these guns around, because if you are like a, a small power that has a limited range of action, you can just bring what you have uh, at short range and without org needing to organize that much. France or Burgundy at this time are kind of rocketing in terms of military uh, capabilities, they will also clash between one between the other that they had already done it in the past. Um, and, and another thing is waging prolonged uh, campaigns in, into various um, um, tactical and strategical scenarios and needing to, to, to take with you subst a substantial amount of guns and needing the simple fact of, 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 of wheeling them around in some way. Uh, in 1461 when the um, uh, excuse me, in, uh, in in the 70s of uh, of the 15th century, when the Swiss uh, defeated the 
the Burgundian armies, they, they made a very rich treasure of cannons <laughs> that um, th in this sense show you how um, this very technologically advanced um, armies like the Burgundian one that was pretty far ahead conceptually in terms of military organization could simply be defeated by something, by something relatively more simple like uh, the Swiss pikeman phalanx was and that artillery in this sense wasn't much of a wasn't really effective at that point. The Swiss usually had a, a, f a very few guns, uh, very small ones or two, so uh, in, this, in that sense it's doctrine uh, that really matters at that point and not really technology. So uh, in and, and, and this is really a, a lesson that has to be learned when when studying these things. Um, the uh, and let's consider that um, these can the problem of mobility of these cannons also presented itself in the in, in moment of aiming because the cannons uh, up to the very late 15th century they hadn't. Um, uh, in their uh, under their gun barrels, the uh, tournions. The tr the tournion is just making an example. It's uh, um <coughs> it's like um 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 a piv uh, It's it's like a cylindrical protrusion that you load that it has in the side of of the barrel, uh, or maybe beneath it. But it depends and lodged on the um, on the support that you have for the gun. Uh, which is used as either a mounting or pivoting point. So um, this was a late introduction and uh, you could elevate the gun, so lowering or, hi uh, or hiring it, by um, uh, uh, either putting a, a, um, usually a wedge um, under the, uh, the breech uh, and, and like putting, like mm, hammering that with a, with a hand spike so that physics is no opinion, or, uh, at least up to a certain point. Um, and, and you could assure that this gun would fire at that, um, at that height. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, let's say that um, uh, 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 an advancement in, into this was the, the actually cast on Trunion, because initially speaking this was done with Trunions that were maybe not even part of the barrel, so uh, you you could invent uh, all the ways in order to 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 make the gun aim. Uh, sometimes uh, <laughs> the the uh, the the aiming was achieved by literally making the the carriage uh, the gun carriage tilt, like even pushing. Uh, uh, you know, like digging the the carriage into to the ground and <laughs> really a set, uh, you know, um, uh, to really uh, st uh, stabilize that, uh, ar arranging that in that fashion. Uh, and you can imagine that also carts, in this sense, had to be pretty resistant things. Um, um, the, the the static mount, and that's the reason why usually that they didn't, they couldn't fire from there. They had to be lifted up and put on more static mountings in order to to be more. Uh, first of all, not to damage the cards because the recoil would be uh, consistent. There's such mm, the biggest weapons were considerably heavy and considerably powerful, so uh, that was an obvious need. Um, but so, as you understand, something very initially very um, um, really complicated, uh, really complex, and 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 um, that needed um, um, a lot of patience, at least. But this also tells you that uh, probably uh, guns <coughs> at that stage were kind of, I mean, our, the crews had enough time to place them, like, um, as I was saying, siege warfare was something very long, so theoretically you had the time to prepare cannons to, to, to field them in a way that they would fire um, at, mm, at the desired point with, uh, after having uh, um, uh, engineered the, the um, their emplacement in, in a suitable fashion for, for aiming straight at the target, so uh, the reason why probably this eventually developed uh, in something more uh, uh, technologically uh, efficient into the 16th century is that, is that guns 
is that the world warfare had kind of um, um, fastened up like uh, the as I was saying um, greater powers having a longer range of uh, a, a longer strategic range and therefore having to, to ship these cannons more quickly uh, in various situations and therefore needing something more uh, more effective more uh, something quicker to deploy them to to aim at them um, and hence the the solution of finding something more convenient. You don't have to think that before these times the Europeans really didn't, ha or anyone else for that matter, didn't have the, the actual technology of achieving that. It's simply that the problem probably has not, had not um, been posed yet uh, uh, um, uh, at, at the point of needing that solution to be to be found out, so this is usually how the whole thing works. Um, and usually, these guns, um, you know, in, in 15th century, um, there would be um, guns were already uh, built up in, in construction, especially the iron ones. Uh, that were um, built up with wrought iron bars and and rings uh, eventually uh, welded together. And these pieces were uh, usually um, mm, they they kept being used. This usually happened for the larger guns. Um, it was a bit risky, telling the truth, because the structure was um, suscep success um, susceptible of uh, explosion. Um, usually, uh, bro um, um, cast bronze um, cannons were preferred. Uh, the um, the the built-up ones usually were um, uh, were um, uh, breech loaders. Mm -hmm. So here, I think the um, uh, the uh, mm, there is also a different type of uh, you know the bigger guns in, in, in this sense could be operated better, hence the, the need of uh, having this kind of composite formation. But the best material, uh, the more, the most elastic one, that could mm, absorb better uh, the, um, all the, the, the energy, the, all the strengths that operated uh, into those weapons uh, were the, um, the cast bronze ones, that were usually muzzle loaders. Uh, so, um, and, and they were kind of better um, in the sense that mm, well there are pro and uh, like there are mm, mm, plus and minuses to this because the uh, the iron um, uh, the road iron cannons were usually uh, cheaper and that was the reason why they were created but the problem is that they needed a higher temperature to to be um, cast uh, so uh, and they would uh, tend to explode uh, more easily. Uh, well, the the bronze ones were more expensive, but um, they were usually m more uh, reliable. By the way, naval naval artillery uh, usually uh, had bronze guns because they 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 they, they don't rust. Um, uh, and you also have to think of the av availability of these um, uh, of the metal. Uh, of the metals and um, and therefore all the the, the problems of um, of supplying and 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 um, and, and and so on. Um, so the, the the also the, the bronze cannons usually uh, they, they could explode as well, but there was a bit more of a uh, telltale at this point, especially where there would be a sort of bulge that formed into the uh, into the the uh, into the area it was um, uh, explo ab about to to explode, so you could at least tell. Um, especially these very big brown, uh, these very big iron cannons like bombers, um, sometimes were extremely risky to operate because they could really explode and without any um, um, any. Um, other um, substantially without any uh, warning, <laughs> forewarning, um, uh, and that's it. And um, the um, you know the, the first uh, artillery, effective artillery parks uh, used in in warfare seem um, in, in Western warfare seem to have been deployed by the French for the reasons that we were 
mentioning before um, I mean chiefly the fact that France had a considerable um, uh, resources to invest into warfare uh, and and this was showed uh, especially during the wars of Italy uh, when Charles VIII invaded Italy they he um, he had a, a very uh, large uh, uh, artillery train with him um, which was enough at certain moments to simply make uh, the cities, uh, the Italian cities, let him pass without any uh, opposition because uh, it could uh, destroy, especially the the, uh, the city walls you know, of the great urban centers in in, in this fashion. Um, and, uh, and and at the Battle of Fornovo, there was the major engagement at this point uh, with the Italian League against against the French army, they, the French did employ this, this, these cannons in, in, in the battle. Uh, and were other, uh, other engagements like um, the battle of, um, of, Re of Ravenna in 1512 into which um, the, um, you know, there is this idea that Italians were backwards into uh, the um, development of, uh, of artillery. Uh, because you know when the French arrived they they had uh, they were backwards compared to them um, the French uh, it is true that the French were pioneering especially the organizational problems of of, um, of uh, such a large guns but the Italians really were ahead uh, in for European standards into guns as well there is Machiavelli that always has to adapt reality in his own way in claiming that these Italian guns compared to the French were kind of useless because he wanted to criticize, but really this is not true. Uh, the Battle of, of Ravenna, uh, the Ferrer race guns seemingly were quite effective. Ferrara was really ahead even in the same Italy for, um, for artillery technology. Um, they dur during battle of R the Battle of Ravenna of, of 1512 is one of the bloodiest engagements of the Italian wars, uh, like the French and the uh, and the um, and the Spanish, uh, together with the Italians, uh, uh, can uh, you know, cannoned each other uh, for a long time with very heavy losses. So the French uh, had. 30 guns, the, the Spanish 12. It seems a few, but if you, for, for those times, so it was really a huge uh, quantity of this. And it was a, ba a, uh, a bloodbath, really. So uh, 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 the French, in this sense, were compensating in part their lack of good infantry because France had confirmed itself a major power uh, in military terms for its cavalry and artillery. They were too aristocratic for, uh, for letting, like the Spanish were doing, um, you know, um, large infantry formations form, or at least Francis the uh, tried, but he failed. He created he you can't really invent something from from scratch without a military tradition on your own. So the French were mainly using um, Swiss mercenaries that were the best um, infantry around. Um, and um and, and the Battle of Marignano, uh, for instance, that is uh an, another major engagement of the um uh, of the of the Italian wars fought in in fifty after three years of uh in, in of um, after Ravenna um in, in fifteen uh fifteen. So the um, basically the decline of Swiss uh, infantry, although Swiss, uh, Swiss infantry continued to be effective even after Barignano at one point, simply because the Swiss uh, were butchered down by French uh, gunners and and, um, and arquebusier, um, uh, and, and therefore showing that uh, an infantry formation like the Swiss one when isolated on the battlefield without the support of their own guns uh, was uh, practically uh, destined to, to, to defeat. So um, in a certain sense the Swiss pikemen opened the Renaissance warfare but kind of uh, got knocked out uh, equally soon um, because um, you know a, a an only infantry army is something 
uh, that cannot work more than much. It doesn't matter how effective the uh, the, uh, the 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 pike uh, the pikemen are tactically speaking they still need support and it's a bit uh, this kind of of game into the Italian wars I mean certain countries that had a a relative um, um, specialization according to their military tradition that uh, worked uh, the whole thing uh, the Italians probably being the more balanced but being too small as individual states to compete with national monarchies I eventually it would be the, the Spanish who managed to uh, reach the best combination with uh, the Tercio uh, of the Spanish uh, it was mainly an infantry formation of, uh, of pike and shot um, pikemen and arquebusiers but also you know being eventually um, uh, in, in this sense, um, surpassing that monolithic Swiss idea of you know just just pikes, and and even against French uh, cavalry, they managed with pike and shot of defeating them. And artillery, obviously, growing in in you know you know armies uh, at this point. Um, uh, as I was saying, the uh, the standardization was still very um, uh, something very theoretical. Uh, in many ways, um, the um, the the idea of standardization is something that comes when you uh, you need to rely on on the performances of the single guns uh, in a um, in a sort of practice um, warfare that is normally already standard in, in his own way so it, it, it's not strange that the first attempts of standardization of guns came from the mid of the 16th century where more or less all mm, uh, powers in spite of minor differences essentially relied on pike and shot infantry when cavalry was already um, was es essentially um, uh, it didn't disappear at all from from the battlefields, but it was reduced mostly to this hit and run tactics with the um, with the caracol tactics with um, by sh unloading the guns uh, um, uh, of, of of mechanic pi pistols a very close range from from pikemen and then falling back uh, and eventually attacking if maybe artillery or other infantry had managed to to dis you know to 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 sensibly weaken uh, the uh, the pikes the enemy pikes but uh, more or less um, th there was an homogenization of of warfare and at that point uh, artillery seemed uh, to that that it had to adapt to this. Um, pre-expected uh, performances like the in 1544 uh, the 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 Holy Roman Emperor Charles the uh, the fifth attempted at least to impose some mm, standardization we are really at the first attempts at this point um, for um, for for reliability indeed and um, um, he um, he conceived cannons that had to fire uh, a 40 pounds uh, 40 pound bolts uh, the 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 24 pounder cannon Moyan and the 12 pounder Colveran and um, uh, of two varieties and um, two two models of six pounder Colveran and a light three pounder Falcon um, uh, eventually um, he the the son of his um, great rival uh, Henry uh, the second in 1550 um, um, instituted the um, six, six the so-called six calibers of France uh, that conceived uh, a 33 pounder cannon um, that had to be uh, 10 feet and 6 inches long uh, uh, teamed by uh, um, by uh, 21 horses to, to carry um, then a 15 pounder culveran uh, a um, uh, a one um, um, uh, other uh, um, 
a, um, a three fort pounder falconet uh, and and I other you know uh, a seven pounder basset coldoran uh, a two pounder coldoran moran um, and uh, and all and all these measures that really uh, you don't have to think had a, a, a the sake of standardization in absolute terms. I mean, these could really be changed in uh, even from a year to another. What was important is it was giving certain standards that even use us um, are useful for us to understand what kind of gun roughly we're talking about, what kind of specializations were effectively um, defining themselves into this uh, renaissance warfare um, and therefore the tactical use that they, they were meant for. Uh, another evident thing is here that uh, every country was using its own um, measures uh, uh, in its own way, not just because the actual uh, measures were uh, standard measures were different were different but because the um, uh, the type of guns uh, in this sense could could be uh, could be um, different uh, at this time we know usually uh, there were the, 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 the cannon type that was um, uh, the intended essentially for smashing down walls at a uh, considerable range um, they um, they could vary from from really uh, a quarter cannon that was almost one ton in weight to a uh, to a basilisk that could w be uh, up to six tons in weight um, in having the respective range of two uh, and uh, and four kilometers that are considerable obviously that's I think the maximum range um, because the um, the useful range being uh, the effective range for for aiming was probably uh, much uh, much shorter then it was the, the covering type that that, that were longer uh, usually uh, and and conceived for a uh, higher velocity uh, and, and longer range as well um, and it would make up the the um, the, the majority of, of, of field guns uh, at these times um, and they they could vary here even more than, than cannons in proportions uh, the, the smaller colubrines could weigh not even 100 kilos. Uh, the larger ones uh, uh, reaching up to three tons and and, and more. Uh, so you can have um, uh, essentially uh, from 700 to mm, yards uh, to uh, 7,000. So decuplicating. So you understand how even the same colubrine could be. Um, uh, smaller. By the way, at this time, I, you know, if you read, um, you know, if you go uh, watch the 15th century uh, artillery types, you you notice that the culverin was the culverin was something different. Uh, and uh, at this time, in Renaissance period, uh, mid of 16th century, the uh, even the uh, the names, the categories were were changed. The culverin here contained other t many uh, many types of guns, including uh, the serpentines, uh, even certain bombards. So it's very complicated even to even to classify um, the wall the wall type, and we don't clearly have um, a clue of what uh, such cannons could really be, just for for uh, listening to their name. Um, because as I was saying, there could be a, a type of gun that could be of with with those characteristics, but being considerably variable in dimensions, and we don't really know uh, at that point what kind of gun practically was, because uh, like in the case of the Colvagan, you know, you had one thing that could shoot at 700 meters, something that could shoot at, at seven kilometers. It, it they kind of made a, a big difference. Um, and, and there would be also mortars that were. Uh, famously, uh, you know, short barreled that had uh, an high tra traje trajectory, um, uh, mainly for, for for during sieges for 
you know, getting up to the city walls and hitting, bombarding from from the height. Um, there were also other more curious weapons that you can find in also obviously in previous centuries like the Ribald uh, Ribald can so these so uh, so called organ guns or shrimps or carts of wool that were uh, essentially um, multiple barreled uh, guns with mm, all mounted on a sa uh, on the same carriage that could be fired all at once, so they would make this uh, ridiculous show off <laughs> of of fire uh, in uh, all, all all at once, and uh, and that's it. And you had to reload them <laughs> uh, again uh, all at once. So you can imagine also the speed and the what could be the actual effect and that uh, effectiveness of this even of in front of other kind of guns that could uh, of weapons sorry that could be reloaded much more quicker like longbows that at a certain time were still used by uh, by the the English in the English army by the second half of the 16th century anachronistically but uh, you know the crossbows were still there theoretically also because uh, progressively during the 16th century the uh, the infantry uh, I mean generally the all, all troops involved were kind of growing um, uh, more uh, less and less armored so mm, certain weapons could be uh, continuing to be effective even though the power of firearms was uh, enormously superior to in terms of sheer energy compared to these guns although as we've seen the, the reloading phase could could take really uh, really long but what it is important of these um, seemingly impractical impracticable guns like the organ guns is that they they could really be useful with um, in in situations that that were extremely common like um, skirmishes um, siege warfare uh, small, you know, small clashes, ambushes, and stuff like that. Uh, especially these um, organ guns uh, were something uh, relatively easy to 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 carry, even with a single guy with taking ta pushing it with shafts. Uh, shafts. Um, but there w there were also other type of guns like arquebuses. You know, the arquebuses are. Uh, kind of developed as these um, essentially um, um, mm, portable guns for, for one man use but first of all even for one man use they were quite um, quite quite heavy quite uh, um, complex uh, to to reload uh, so you needed uh, a fork to, to 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 plant in the ground to 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 which onto which posing the, the arquebus and then spent it took a lot of times and and certain arquebuses were even mm, considerably heavy and could be could do, could work essentially as artillery on their own in their own way i mean what's the difference between a uh, you know a, a hand arquebus and uh, an artillery arquebus you can't see that uh, on generally speaking but there is no scientific midpoint from which the, the difference actually starts so we know Arquebus is also mounted on, on light carts and carried around and um, you have to imagine that they had essentially mm, quite useful even even around the, the, the mid of the 16th century like I don't know, maybe you were skirmishing into certain houses, you were entrenched there and fencing off enemy cavalry, you know, there was a, an armored cavalryman coming to you, you shot uh, uh, with this thing, uh, boom, and you could really, you know, pierce through his uh, his plate armor and killing him um, uh, immediately, and uh, this was th these were pretty bloody affairs, really. Uh, so even these small guns having their, especially their mm, psychological impact sometimes even more than the actual physical one, you have to imagine on also the the, uh, the sen um, you know the, the sensual di di uh, dimension of, of of this warfare, the shocks of explosions and all. 
uh, the, the smoke uh, that hampered visibility and all these things um, so um, there were really um, and and these guns really uh, this um, um, having these carts that could carry several guns or something that you find still relatively uh, late in time like during the English Civil War for instance the the, the Royalists captured in uh, 1644 um, uh, here I read two barricades drawn on wheels in each seven small brass and lantern guns charged with case shot so um, yeah th this was pretty common even in, uh, on an age into which artillery was pretty pretty developed and relatively uh, standardized um, there was uh, substantial standardization also in in uh, late 16th century uh, Holland by hand of Prince Maurice of Nassau famously who um, who mm, among the other things for, for, for the reforms uh, in military affairs for, for which he is um, famous uh, he ordered the standardization of uh, certain gun types to 6 pounders, 12 pounders, 24 pounders, 48 pounders so you see uh, even uh, dimensions that are um, essentially multiples to one of the other usually uh, twice the size of the of the other um, uh, so that we're pushing towards a sort of rationalization together with the standardization of, of, of these weapons um, and the and, and the old things all, all this was also meant to simplify logistics because uh, if you have it's not just about the gun of making the gun but uh, you know think ab at making the cards you know if you already know that you have s a, a certain amount of guns that has that dimension well, you you will work. You will commission uh, cards or other um, uh, other um, pieces that are needed to to serve the uh, the that artillery accordingly to to that that dimension. That can simplify uh, problems that otherwise had to be solved uh, solved into situations like the same campaign that could create considerable. Um, the loss of time of uh, resources and attrition overall so all things that very slowly very progressively uh, were put in motion by by these needs with the increase of even of the need of carrying this these guns around and their uh, spread into um, uh, into um, into armies the, the Dutch army standardized um, also infantry guns in this sense three or four pounders uh, for instance so the the that was the direction it was taking centuries as as we're seeing um, so uh, another point of these guns you have to imagine logistically speaking was not really uh, uh, the the cards and themselves but also the terrain in which you had to take to 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 shift them because uh, you have to think that most of Europe definitely didn't have very efficient um, 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 road system, <laughs> uh, or at least the roads could be in very dear conditions, also under bad weather, uh, with the mud and all, uh, or simply you had to take our paths that weren't um, that weren't uh, that weren't paved. They didn't have uh, even maybe but a few country road and stuff like that. So um, there is the famous Scottish Great Colveran in 1513 that required not less than 36 oxen uh, to to really push it. Uh, uh, this was a big gun, but relatively um, you 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 can find other English Colveran that needed uh, nine horses at the time of the English Civil War. Uh, sometimes you had literally to trail these. Um, these guns because maybe the cart could do more attrition than all because you imagine how you ha uh, having uh, all a mud day situation uh, rather than having the cart really um, uh, drawing it <laughs> you know, like sinking into mud uh, it, it would be uh, at that point uh, uh, paradoxically uh, better to, to literally trail the, the naked gun into into the mud and having less attrition in that sense if the wheels can't really and really go down into mud th there isn't a uh, much uh, 
much of a, a thing that you can do in this sense. You, it, it's also lighter because the cart uh, also has um, has its own weight. Uh, but it would soon become evident that something else was needed, and this is the time in which, at the, at the mid of the 16th century, the limbers uh, appear. Um, the um, it similarly was um, a French invention, which uh, really um, is kind of makes sense considering the um, the um, uh, the. The, the 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 wide use that uh, um, that the French made of artillery. So limber is this two-wheeled cart that is um, meant to support the trail or artillery piece, mm -hmm. and that is usually um, uh, meant to tow the gun uh, um, by um, putting the. Uh, the gun's shaft, uh, shafts over over the same limber and um, therefore uh, not making them uh, touch the ground and create attrition and um, and in this sense um, the the limbers were um, were capable of um, fast you know, speeding up the, the movement of of, of artillery uh quite effectively um they um uh, usually um the mm, I, I was reading something um yeah but i i wanted to say simply that um the these limbers um when they were created in the mid of the 16th century, seemingly were not of uni they they would they wouldn't be uh, in universal use in a in a short time. Like it seems that only a few um, powers uh, made use of this system. That and the reason could partially <laughs> be the fact and, and the, the limbers were widespread in this sense between the French and Spanish and and, and the imperial armies, um, even in Holland. And maybe one reason is really the fact that um, there is this area of of Europe that is roughly today's Benelux, you know, the, the Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg. This that had become the border between France and uh, the Empire, Empire that was allied with Spain, and uh, the Spanish would come through um the from 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 Italy into um into Germany passing the Al crossing the Alps and therefore engaging into warfare close to France because that's an area that is uh, relatively flat so warfare with rivers and all it's, it's quite suited for um for kind of more intense engagements with more open ground situations um the sieges of these major fortresses on located on the rivers so here the need for for increase the need for gun and, and this area would remain geographically speaking some of the most basically the battleground of Europe for for centuries like you know all the great wars uh, up to World War II have been fought in countries like Belgium Belgium has a, a, a huge amount of battlefields in history from from this very moment also from before naturally but especially in this moment because France was there um the, the Germany was from the other side uh the Spanish would arrive from the south the English too sometimes they would land into into Flanders so the Flanders became uh, the the center of this very intense warfare and the major um the major battles of this time so it is possible considering that that war there was waged also by his great coalitions etc that um a greater use a great mo a greater mobility of 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 um um, of, of of these big troops on the open fields would kind of need increasingly uh, um, uh, systems of uh, of gun tra or artillery training that that had to be increasingly sophisticated in, in regions like I don't know the, the mountainous areas, forested areas. Maybe it was even difficult to march with with artillery in the first place. So this might explain roughly, generically speaking. Obviously, limbers were widespread elsewhere but the fact that the major evidence historical evidence is there it is is to me an indicator that maybe 
uh, it was because of that need, uh, because it was m more needed in those environmental uh, conditions than than in others. Uh, but th this is just my um, my opinion. Um, the uh, the ammunition usually um, talking about rim limb birds because usually there are also in modern um, in more modern artillery the the ammunition was um, attached to 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 the limbers with essentially with making the limber another cart uh, on its own and carrying the ammunition but usually um, the, the at this time the uh, ammunition and artillery were separated and ammunition carts usually um, being in other um, yeah, of easy access for artillery, but not really attached. Um, probably they had small uh, amounts of uh, immediate of of, of of um projectiles and powder for immediate use. But um, you know, l um, taking ammunition was something extremely risky at this time, uh, like in others, by the way. But uh, pr means were more primitive and risk of you know making blowing <laughs> everything up you know by the way uh, among infantry this happened like uh, the cadet ridge of, of our cabusiers um, were something that um, at, at this time could um, mm, uh, ignite and flare quite easily so some t uh, this uh, for instance um, for infantry uh, implied that our cabusiers formations were quite um, quite rarefacted because their kibbuziers had to be substantially distant from each other because sometimes if they had been closer they could really uh, cause a domino effect and boom 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 and all the car kibbuziers um, bandoliers uh, exploding uh, at contact with each other and pieces of people <laughs> like flying o off everywhere this was a problem also for um, um, for artillery indeed um, and um, and another big problem, however, artillery in general was really manning all this thing. As we have seen, the uh, usually a great amount of of, uh, of animals were used to to push these guys, uh, these <laughs> these guns, not guys, uh, like oxen or horses. But sometimes you you wouldn't need simply pioneers to open the path for making artillery pass because one thing is to make him pass s soldiers, one one thing is to make pass uh, uh, guns of several tons. So usually um, in in Europe um, local mm, people would local inhabitants would really be obliged to 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 provide for this like. They were imposed to to create a way uh, to open a path, uh, and only um, in the Turkish army, the Ottoman army, seemingly was a corpse. The top uh, arbaches that were um, thousands um, of of men strong, that was attached, and um, they um, and, and this is explainable in many ways. Like the Turks, uh, the Ottomans were quite organized, and in in their in their armies, um, but especially they made a, a, a very um, spread use of big guns, like these monster bombers, like the the, uh, the Dardanelles guns, and uh, uh, that I that you can check out in the video I dedicated to it, um, and and that were extremely heavy things. They would need uh, uh, thousands of, of even of of animals to to push these things were really monstrous, so probably they, uh, the Ottomans had a, a really a thing for artillery in these big show-offs, uh, especially in the early times, um, and um, they did it for ideological reasons. But uh, practically, you have to think that the Ottomans had this time were extremely wealthy. They they had really enormous territories, like almost all the Balkans. Turkey, um, lands in the Black Sea, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, I mean a, a huge amount of of territories and therefore uh, much wealthier than France so they could, especially in, in early uh, Renaissance warfare, they could feel these monster bombers because probably were mm, consistently uh, effective at that point against city walls. Like, it's better maybe to have a big gun 
uh, at that point uh, to sm to try to smash a city wall then many smaller guns that have to to be pointed uh, uh, in in all parts and to you know to to make crumble bit by bit the, the city wall instead with the single major guns uh, that were however always accompanied by uh, by other smaller guns it was um quicker at least to to create a a major breach and a reason for which the the, the Ottomans had evidently had to face um this um these major logistical problems and this uh, corps of pioneers was uh, already attached uh, to 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 their armies differently from other european uh, militaries um and um for the rest um we can see that um certain ways to to carry uh guns was still quite primitive in many ways like limbers could be the right like very um um, very small uh, wheeled carts that just had to uh, to raise above the the ground level the the gun shafts that could be pushed in that sense even by by men just pushing the the wheels and the car and the shafts so you 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 could find up to the the seventeenth century even beyond this still very primitive means of of uh, of pushing guns and all as well as the use of of relatively anachronistic pieces like in the case of the Dardanelles guns they they saw action they, they were a, fi uh, a 15th century gun they saw action effectively as naval artillery or at least a coastal artillery better uh, even into the 19th century so you know the essentials were were there practically speaking you need something that fires uh, a bolt that crashes into structures sometimes even into people um, doesn't matter wh wh whether it's a 15th century bombard <laughs> or a 17th century advanced uh, cool van or something like that you know it, it's still something that I up to a certain extent makes its its substantial job so uh, even in in contexts in, into which the um the centralization of of the states and therefore the professionalization and the uniformation of the military was pretty low you could find normally even uh, royal armies uh, fielding this extremely heterogeneous amount of guns and uh, uh, and dealing with it if you think about England England had this very slow development essentially it's not before the end of the 17th century that its military um, First of all, from a quantitative point of view, can um, you know be at the level of the other major uh, European powers, and not before the uh, the English Civil War, that it had an up-to-date army of veterans of people who had uh, a, a fully uh, that compensated the lag that from essentially the, the Wars of the Roses had characterized England regard uh, relatively to, to to the other continental powers. So um, that is something that is felt uh, into warfare, uh, in the sense that uh, if you take a power like France that c could really spend a lot for the uh, modernization of the military and the the development of effective uh, weapons of, of, of fortifications you had something of first-class quality other nations didn't simply and uh, even if you go to Eastern Europe there are these kind of principalities that in some ways fought in anachronistic ways but that however adapted in, in with their own possibilities to to Western warfare pretty effectively. If you take, this is not about artillery, but if you take the, the Polish Hussars, well, these were guys who had lances that were so long that could even attack frontally the Western um, uh, foot pikemen. Um, so that tells you that it's not truly really and, and successfully doing that, and the Swedes know something about it, um, because uh, this is important. You know, it's uh, and I want to stress that, like at the beginning of the, the video, it's not about really the technology; it's about how you employ your means. Mm? And war is always asymmetrical, 
actually warfare is asymmetrical by definition so uh, you go on essentially with what you have then you have to start at a certain point yeah there are certain differences that, that are consistent but usually to this period they're they're not in, like in any other period they're not really about the um, you know the, the um, lag in technology but really the lag in in centralizing state in in um, in centralizing the state in being able to field uh, um, enough troops to have them trained to have them fed to have them ordered and and also standardized in equipment in order to facilitate the logistics and all rather than having you know that gun that is the most advanced you can see in the world as a matter of fact there were many uh, times into which there were extremely sophisticated uh, technologies at this time that were used even in artillery that maybe didn't grant victory at all so um, yeah uh, this is definitely what could happen I don't know how this video turned out I hope uh, you enjoyed it uh, if you liked it please share it otherwise leave a like uh, or uh, also subscribe to my channel if you want to receive further news for now I I thank you heartily as always for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye